Chapter 16, Part 11 of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 2, by John Fox. Edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter 16. Persecutions in England during the reign of Queen Mary. Part 11. We have noticed in the former part of our narratives of the martyrs, some whose affection would have led them even to sacrifice their own lives, to preserve their husbands. But here, agreeable to scripture language, a mother proves, indeed, a monster in nature. Neither conjugal nor maternal affection could impress the heart of this disgraceful woman. Although our afflicted Christian had experienced so much cruelty and falsehood from the woman who was bound to him by every tie, both human and divine, yet with a mild and forbearing spirit, he overlooked her misdeeds, during her calamity endeavoring all he could to procure relief for her malady and soothing her by every possible expression of tenderness. Thus she became in a few weeks nearly restored to her senses. But, alas, she returned again to her sin, as a dog returneth to his vomit. Malice against the saints of the Most High was seated in her heart too firmly to be removed, and as her strength returned, her inclination to work wickedness returned with it. Her heart was hardened by the prince of darkness, and to her may be applied these afflicting and soul-harrowing words. Can the Ethiopian change his skin, or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good, that are accustomed to do evil. Weighing this text duly with another, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. How shall we presume to refine away the sovereignty of God by arranging Jehovah at the bar of human reason, which, in religious matters, is too often opposed by infinite wisdom? Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. The ways of heaven are indeed inscrutable and it is our bounden duty to walk ever dependent on God, looking up to Him with humble confidence and hope in His goodness, and ever confess His justice, and where we cannot unravel there learn to trust. This wretched woman, pursuing the horrid dictates of a heart hardened and depraved, was scarcely confirmed in her recovery when, stifling the dictates of honor, gratitude, and every natural affection. She again accused her husband, who was once more apprehended and taken before Sir John Mordaunt, knight, and one of Queen Mary's commissioners. Upon examination, his judge, finding him fixed in opinions which militated against those nursed by superstition and maintained by cruelty, he was sentenced to confinement and torture in Lollard's Tower. Here he was put into the painful stocks, and had a dish of water set by him, with a stone put into it. To what purpose God knoweth, except it were to show that he should look for little other substance, which is credible enough if we consider their like practices upon divers before mentioned in this history. As, among others, upon Richard Smith, who died through their cruel imprisonment touching whom, when a godly woman came to Dr. Story to have leave she might bury him, he asked her if she had any straw or blood in his mouth. By what he means thereby, I leave to the judgment of the wise. On the first day of the third week of our martyr's suffering, an object presented itself to his view which made him indeed feel his tortures with all their force, and to execrate with bitterness only short of cursing 
the author of his misery. To mark and punish the proceedings of his tormentors remained with the Most High, who knoweth even the fall of a sparrow, and in whose sacred word it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. This object was his own son, a child of the tender age of eight years. For fifteen days had its hapless father been suspended by his tormentor by the right arm and left leg, and sometimes by both, shifting his positions for the purpose of giving him strength to bear and to lengthen the date of his sufferings. When the unoffending innocent, desirous of seeing and speaking to its parent, applied to Bonner for permission to do so, the poor child being asked by the bishop's chaplain the purport of his errand, he replied that he wished to see his father. "'Who is thy father?' said the chaplain. "'John Fetty,' returned the boy, at the same time pointing to the place where he was confined. The interrogating miscreant on this said, "'Why, thy father is a heretic!' The little champion again rejoined, with energy sufficient to raise admiration in any breast, except that of this unprincipled and unfeeling wretch, this miscreant, eager to execute the behests of a remorseless queen. My father is no heretic, for you have Balaam's mark. Irritated by reproach so aptly applied, the indignant and mortified priest concealed his resentment for a moment, and took the undaunted boy into the house, where, having him secure, he presented him to others, whose baseness and cruelty being equal to his own, they stripped him to the skin, and applied their scourges to so violent a degree that, fainting beneath the stripes inflicted on his tender frame, and covered with the blood that flowed from them, the victim of their ungodly wrath was ready to expire under his heavy and unmerited punishment. In this bleeding and helpless state was the suffering infant, covered only with his shirt, taken to his father by one of the actors in the horrid tragedy, who, while he exhibited the heart-rending spectacle, made use of the vilest taunts, and exulted in what he had done. The dutiful child, as if recovering strength at the sight of his father, on his knees implored his blessing. Alas, Will, said the affected parent, in trembling amazement, who hath done this to thee? The artless innocent related the circumstances that led to the merciless correction which had been so basely inflicted upon him. But when he repeated the reproof bestowed on the chaplain, and which was promptly an undaunted spirit, he was torn from his weeping parent and conveyed again to the house, where he remained a close prisoner. Bonner, somewhat fearful that what had been done could not be justified even among the bloodhounds of his own voracious pack, concluded in his dark and wicked mind to release John Fetty, for a time at least, from the severities he was enduring in the glorious cause of everlasting truth, whose bright rewards are fixed beyond the boundaries of time, within the confines of eternity, where the arrow of the wicked cannot wound, even where there shall be no more sorrowing for the blessed, who in the mansion of eternal bliss shall glorify the Lamb for ever and ever. He was accordingly, by order of Bonner, how disgraceful to all dignity to say bishop, liberated from the painful bonds, and led from Lollard's tower to the chamber of that ungodly and infamous butcher, where he found the bishop bathing himself before a great fire, and at his first entering the chamber, Fetty said, God be here and peace. God be here and peace, said Bonner. That is neither God's speed nor good morrow. If ye kick against this peace, said Fetty, then this is not the place that I seek for. A chaplain of the bishop, standing by, turned the poor man about, and thinking to abash him, said in a mocking wise, what have we here, a player? While Fetty was thus standing in the bishop's chamber, he espied, hanging about the bishop's bed, a pair of great black beads, whereupon he said, My lord, I think the hangman is not far off, for the halter, pointing to the beads, is here already. 
at which words the bishop was in a marvellous rage. Then he immediately after espied also, standing in the bishop's chamber, in the window a little crucifix. Then he asked the bishop what it was, and he answered that it was Christ. Was he handled as cruelly as he is here pictured? said Fetty. Yea, that he was, said the bishop, and even so cruelly will you handle such as come before you, for you are unto God's people as Caiaphas was unto Christ. The bishop, being in a great fury, said, Thou art a vile heretic, and I will burn thee, or else I will spend all I have unto my gown. Nay, my lord, said Fetty, you were better to give it to some poor body, that he may pray for you. Bonner, notwithstanding his passion, which was raised to the utmost by the calm and pointed remarks of this observing Christian, thought it most prudent to dismiss the father, on account of the nearly murdered child. His coward soul trembled for the consequences which might ensue. Fear is inseparable from little minds, and this dastardly pampered priest experienced its effects so far as to induce him to assume the appearance of that he was an utter stranger to, namely mercy. The father, on being dismissed by the tyrant Bonner, went home with a heavy heart with his dying child, who did not survive many days the cruelties which had been inflicted on him. How contrary to the will of our great king and prophet, who mildly taught his followers, was the conduct of this sanguinary and false teacher, this vile apostate from his god to Satan. But the arch-fiend has taken entire possession of his heart, and guided every action of the sinner he had hardened, who, given up to terrible destruction, was running the race of the wicked, marking his footsteps with the blood of the saints, as if eager to arrive at the goal of eternal death. DELIVERANCE OF DR. SANDS This eminent prelate, vice-chancellor of Cambridge, at the request of the Duke of Northumberland, when he came down to Cambridge in support of Lady Jane Grey's claim to the throne, undertook at a few hours' notice to preach before the Duke and the University. The text he took was such as presented itself in opening the Bible, and a more appropriate one he could not have chosen, namely the three last verses of Joshua. As God gave him the text, so he gave him also such order and utterance that it excited the most lively emotions in his numerous auditors. The sermon was about to be sent to London to be printed when news arrived that the Duke had returned and Queen Mary was proclaimed. The Duke was immediately arrested, and Dr. Sands was compelled by the university to give up his office. He was arrested by the Queen's order, and when Mr. Mildmay wondered that so learned a man could willfully incur danger and speak against so good a princess as Mary, the doctor replied, If I would do as Mr. Mildmay had done, I need not fear bonds. He came down armed against Queen Mary, before a traitor, now a great friend. I cannot with one mouth blow hot and cold in this manner. A general plunder of Dr. Sand's property ensued, and he was brought to London upon a wretched horse. Various insults he met on the way from the bigoted Catholics, and as he passed through Bishopsgate Street, a stone struck him to the ground. He was the first prisoner that entered the tower in that day on a religious account. His man was admitted with his Bible, but his shirts and other articles were taken from him. On Mary's coronation day the doors of the dungeon were so laxly guarded that it was easy to escape. A Mr. Mitchell, like a true friend, came to him, afforded him his own clothes as a disguise, and was willing to abide the consequence of being found in his place. This was a rare friendship, but he refused the offer, saying, 
I know no cause why I should be in prison. To do thus were to make myself guilty. I will expect God's good will. Yet do I think myself much obligated to you. And so Mr. Mitchell departed. With Dr. Sands was imprisoned Mr. Bradford. They were kept close in prison twenty-nine weeks. John Fowler, their keeper, was a perverse papist, yet, by often persuading him, at length he began to favor the gospel, and was so persuaded in the true religion that, on a Sunday, when they had Mass in the chapel, Dr. Sands administered the communion to Bradford and to Fowler. Thus Fowler was their son begotten in bonds. To make room for Wyatt and his accomplices, Dr. Sands and nine other preachers were sent to the Marshalsea. The keeper of the Marshalsea appointed to every preacher a man to lead him in the street. He caused them to go on before, and he and Dr. Sands followed conversing together. By this time popery began to be unsavory. After they had passed the bridge, the keeper said to Dr. Sands, I perceive the vain people would set you forward to the fire. You are as vain as they if you, being a young man, will stand in your own conceit and prefer your own judgment before that of so many worthy prelates, ancient, learned, and grave men as be in this realm. If you do so, you shall find me a severe keeper and one that utterly dislikes your religion. Dr. Sands answered, I know my years to be young, and my learning but small. It is enough to know Christ crucified, and he hath learned nothing who seeth not the great blasphemy that is in popery. I will yield unto God, and not unto man. I have read in the scriptures of many godly and courteous keepers. May God make you one. If not, I trust he will give me strength and patience to bear your hard usage. Then said the keeper, Are you resolved to stand to your religion? Yes, quoth the doctor, by God's grace. Truly, said the keeper, I love you the better for it. I did but tempt you. What favor I can show you, you shall be assured of, and I shall think myself happy if I might die at the stake with you. He was as good as his word, for he trusted the doctor to walk in the fields alone, where he met with Mr. Bradford, who was also a prisoner in the king's bench, and had found the same favor from his keeper. At his request he put Mr. Saunders in along with him, to be his bedfellow, and the communion was administered to a great number of communicants. When Wyatt with his army came to Southwark, he offered to liberate all the imprisoned Protestants. But Dr. Sands and the rest of the preachers refused to accept freedom on such terms. After Dr. Sands had been nine weeks prisoner in the Marshalsea, by the mediation of Sir Thomas Holcroft, Knight Marshal, he was set at liberty. Though Mr. Holcroft had the Queen's warrant, the bishop commanded him not to set Dr. Sands at liberty until he had taken sureties of two gentlemen with him, each one bound in unreadable, that Dr. Sands should not depart out of the realm without license. Mr. Holcroft immediately after met with two gentlemen of the North, friends and cousins to Dr. Sands, who offered to be bound for him. After dinner the same day, Sir Thomas Holcroft sent for Dr. Sands to his lodgings at Westminster to communicate to him all he had done. Dr. Sands answered, I give God thanks, who hath moved your heart to mind me so well, that I think myself most bound unto you. God shall requite you, nor shall I ever be found unthankful. But as you have dealt friendly with me, I will also deal plainly with you. I came a free man into prison. I will not go forth a bondman. As I cannot benefit my friends, so will I not hurt them. And if I be set at liberty, I will not tarry six days in this realm, if I may get out. If therefore I may not get free forth, send me to the Marshalsea again, 
and there shall you be sure of me. This answer Mr. Holcroft much disapproved of, but like a true friend, he replied, Seeing you cannot be altered, I will change my purpose, and yield unto you. Come of it what will, I will set you at liberty. And seeing you have a mind to go over sea, get you gone as quick as you can. One thing I require of you, that, while you are there, you write nothing to me hither, for this may undo me. Dr. Sands, having taken an affectionate farewell of him and his other friends in bonds, departed. He went by Winchester House, and there took a boat, and came to a friend's house in London, called William Banks, and tarried there one night. The next night he went to another friend's house, and there he heard that strict search was making for him, by Gardiner's express order. Dr. Sands now conveyed himself by night to one Mr. Birdie's house, a stranger who was in the Marshalsea prison with him a while. He was a good Protestant, and dwelt in Mark Lane. There he was six days, and then removed to one of his acquaintances in Cornhill. He caused his man Quinton to provide two geldings for him, resolved on the morrow to ride into Essex, to Mr. Sands, his father-in-law, where his wife was, which, after a narrow escape, he effected. He had not been there two hours before Mr. Sands was told that two of the guards would that night apprehend Dr. Sands. That night Dr. Sands was guided to an honest farmer's near the sea, where he tarried two days and two nights in a chamber without company. After that he removed to one James Mowers, a shipmaster, who dwelt at Milton Shore, where he waited for a wind to Flanders. While he was there, James Mower brought to him forty or fifty mariners, to whom he gave an exhortation. They liked him so well that they promised to die rather than he should be apprehended. The 6th of May, Sunday, the wind served. In taking leave of his hostess, who had been married eight years without having a child, he gave her a fine handkerchief and an old royal of gold, and said, Be of good comfort. Before that one whole year be passed, God shall give you a child, a boy. This came to pass. For that day twelve month, wanting one day, God gave her a son. Scarcely had he arrived at Antwerp, when he learned that King Philip had sent to apprehend him. He next flew to Augsburg, in Cleveland, where Dr. Sands tarried fourteen days, and then traveled towards Strasbourg, where, after he had lived one year, his wife came to him. He was sick of a flux nine months, and had a child which died of the plague. His amiable wife at length fell into consumption, and died in his arms. When his wife was dead, he went to Zurich, and there was in Peter Martyr's house for the space of five weeks. As they sat at dinner one day, a word was suddenly brought that Queen Mary was dead, and Dr. Sands was sent for by his friends at Strasbourg, where he preached. Mr. Grindle and he came over to England, and arrived in London the same day that Queen Elizabeth was crowned. This faithful servant of Christ, under Queen Elizabeth, rose to the highest distinction in the church, being successively Bishop of Worcester, Bishop of London, and Archbishop of York. End of chapter 16, part 11